Hello, everyone, and welcome to another ASEV Partner webcast. My name is Mo McInerney, Partner Marketing Specialist here at ASEV, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today for this presentation. Today's webcast is being recorded. The link to the recording and the accompanied slides will be posted to the ASEV website calendar of events, and all registrants will receive a follow-up email with the link to those materials once the webcast has concluded. I'd like to remind our audience members that you can submit your questions at any time by clicking the purple Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Today's webcast is no matter where you are, make your business better throughout your SAP S4 HANA journey sponsored by Convergent IS. Our speaker today is Sean Severson, Managing Partner and CEO of Convergent IS. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sean to get us started today. Hey, thanks very much. So it's great, uh, great to join you this afternoon. I see quite a few familiar names in uh, in the attendee list. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, we're we're a little overwhelmed and, and really appreciated with with the response in the in the attendees. Um, there's a, a tremendous number of people that have been able to join us. So thanks so much for taking time out of your day. There's such a movement today. Uh, of organizations that are headed for S4, that are thinking about S4, and there's, there's a really wide variety of, of different positions on that scale. And I wanted to offer something to the community uh, to share some of the experiences that our customers have had, that we've had. Um, several of you will remember that uh, we, we are an S4 HANA uh, reference story for our own company as well, um, as are uh, some of the folks on the phone. So I wanted to share a few things um, that we've found that have really helped as folks that are moving to S4 HANA. If they're thinking about getting there and they're trying to demonstrate the value, then there's several things that we'll highlight here. And then in the case of, for instance, a, a large consumer electronics company um, who makes wearable fitness devices, for instance, who's a customer of ours, um, even after they've gone to S4, uh, some things that have really made a big difference for them in helping with the adoption of SAP, getting that out into the business and making it easy. Uh, I think fundamentally the reason our company exists is to make SAP easy to use. And when we think about things like SAP Fiori, SAP Screen Personas, SAP Cloud Platform, these are all tools that we have that really help with that transition for folks that are uh, working primarily in an on-premise world, um, we've found that there's some fantastic opportunity to renew and improve your journey, whether you're on S4 already or on your way there. Um, so if we take a quick step through the introduction and the, the agenda here, so I'm Sean. Again, thanks very much for joining, everybody. Um, I'll tell you just a tiny bit more about, about convergence, about where we come from, what we're up to. Uh, we'll talk about some of the, the core opportunities of things that we hope you will take with you, um, regardless of who's helping you. We hope you'll take these with you through your journey to S4 and into upgrades and updates of S4 once you're already there. And then we'll talk about a few of the line of business solutions that we would like to suggest can help you, um, whether you're there already or still on your way. So. A few thoughts. Uh, for, for one thing, anybody that's familiar with what that polar vortex is all about, it's uh, certainly hit home in Calgary here. Uh, I think briefly with the wind chill, it hit minus 40. And for those of you that can do temperature conversions, it doesn't matter whether it's Celsius or Fahrenheit at that point. Uh, so we're, we're really looking forward to that blowing back over and, and getting us back to our normal temperatures so that uh, folks like myself and several of the team can get out skiing again. Fundamentally, we, we believe in making SAP easy to use, uh, and that, that, that comes about by, by making things easy to use, making beautifully simple things out of complex things. And so when things are simple, um, it's easy to have that clarity of what's coming next. When you have that clarity, you understand and can very quickly get that velocity of that next step, and then that fundamentally gets you that margin or that value faster. So that's, that's fundamentally what we believe in, or that's our why. And I, I think leading by example really is, is a, a fundamental tenet for us as well. So eating our own cooking is another way of thinking about that. One of the things that we found um, 
and, and this is a slide that SAP put together several years ago, and I just love it so much. And it, it really summarizes a big part of what's going on in the ecosystem, and it has been going on for such a long time. People tend to look at the technology. People talk about a mobile strategy. They get all excited about iPads. And great, um, let's talk about that after we talk about who's going to use them and what they're going to use them for. So when we think about the, the traditional sort of a, a project, um, you've got the normal people process technology. And often the SAP implementations have a tendency to focus on best practice processes and SAP technology. Sometimes people can get left out of that. And so that's really been a fundamental failure of some significant implementation. So, as one of the things that I think is just table stakes for organizations today that are undertaking a journey like this, we really encourage folks to please think about how you can bring people back into that equation and help make that easy. And we'll talk about how, um, how those people are really going to make or break the solution. And it's obviously still underpinned by very strong process and very strong technology. We're all SAP customers in this audience here, so I think that, uh, that keeps part of this simple. But fundamentally what we're talking about is we're talking about focusing on the minds and the hearts of the people that are going to be using this. And really that comes about when you bring those people back into the equation as part of the discovery process and as part of that, that art of the possible. So, a little bit about us. Um, we're an SAP design partner, a build partner. So design means we are the, the first partner-run app house in the Americas. Um, we also build SAP extensions, SAP solutions. So uh, we're, we're an ISV, if you will, with SAP. We can sell SAP solutions, and we uh, also help service that. We're headquartered out of Calgary, Alberta. Uh, for those of you that don't know Calgary, you've probably heard of Banff or Lake Louise if you're fond of skiing. Um, we've been at this for quite a while, and uh, we're, we're delighted at the number of package solutions that we've got. The SAP App House Network is uh, part of SAP Design, and if anyone hasn't heard about SAP Design, it's really uh, it's SAP's IDEO, for those of you that are familiar with that. It's really the part of SAP that helps put users back into the equation, that's helping make design and design thinking and the user experience and the end value that comes out of that really central to the solution, to the product, and to the projects. So we refer to it as a co-innovation lab. Um, often what happens when we work with folks through our app house is that the solution that we end up generating is valuable to other organizations and then it's productized and offered up to others. Uh, or in some cases, it's really bespoke and it's something that's done specifically for an organization and that becomes a competitive advantage for them. So design thinking, I think everybody's heard of that at this point, unless you've been living under a rock. And I know there's um, jokes about, you know, one of the scariest things is people that sell design thinking workshops as a, as a service or something like that. Um, obviously, we're, we're going to touch on, on how some of that happens and, and the role that the design thinking plays in your, in your organization. But I think one of the most important things about that is that it's iterative. And when we think about the change that SAP has made as it's gone from the ASAP methodology to a more agile approach, um, what we're really, when you can call that small a agile, modified agile. Really, that Activate methodology is centered around getting users engaged early and getting people involved in the process and discovery and finding the art of the possible within that solution. So that user-focused approach is really, really important. And effectively, design thinking does, does a couple of things. And sometimes people are thinking, great, you know, here's, here's this new tool. What the heck do I do with it? Um, so, I mean, effectively, it's, it's a great opportunity to apply when you've got something that people are finding a little confusing. Maybe they're not entirely sure what to do with it. Uh, you might have rolled something out and it kind of went kaflop. Uh, you can take a, this type of an approach to collect that feedback, identify what didn't work and what did, tune, adjust, and move forward with a more effective adoption rate and solution. And at the end of the day, if you're looking to implement a technology but you're not entirely sure how to go about it, um, then it creates uh, a framework that can really help you get after that. So 
our approach, we think of it as something a tiny bit more linear. Um, we, we know that there's a, a highly iterative execution here. We find that a lot of the business folks that we deal with tend to like something a little bit more linear, step A, step B, step C. I know there's a lot of linear thinkers in the business and SAP technology space, so um, we found this tends to, to resonate there. But that kind of ultimate simple transformation, whether you're talking about a department, talking about a process, or talking about the whole ERP system, um, this is the effective approach that we take. It's highly, highly iterative, and it's really centered around um, prototyping, getting feedback early, and ultimately finding out what is working and what's not working really, really early. So let's, let's talk about what we usually hear about SAP, and some of these screens might uh, result in some twitches. If anyone needs to take just a break, uh, look away from the screen just a moment if you're, if you're shuddering a little bit, if you've got that twitch from having looked at these screens too many times for too many decades, it's all right, you're not alone. Um, SAP has for a long time had some, some, uh, some reputation for being a little hard to use, it's okay, we get it. It's one of the fundamental premises that our company is, is, is founded on. Um, but it's also something that SAP has taken tremendous strides to improve on. And we've really seen that come to life in the last several years. The reputation and especially the experience for those business users that are, that are using SAP today, to a large extent, if somebody is using SAP GUI, unless they're a power user that's really you know, hammering through transactions at lightning speed, uh, you know, it's, it's confusing and, uh, and, it's, and it's hard. And so that really gets in the way of that velocity, it really gets in the way of that clarity, and it just slows things down, it gums things up. The process underlying it is very, very strong, but we need to make it easier for people to adapt to. One of the things that we've had several conversations with folks in the last several years is, is organizations that are looking at moving to S4 or that have now implemented S4 and they have no Fiori user experience whatsoever. They're all still just about 100% SAP GUI. Uh, and this, of course, is a little bit puzzling. Um, and then, of course, the discussion usually gets into change management. And then the discussion usually gets into, hey, there's a big change, there's financial processes that are changing, the year-end close process is changing, um, there's all of these changes that are happening. And you know, one of the things that, that call me crazy, but uh, I think several of you would agree, like wouldn't, would it be crazy to suggest that maybe giving somebody a simpler, easier, cleaner, clearer user interface and a user experience would help ease that change? And so. That's really part of what we wanted to talk about. And so when we talk about easing that change, we think about the cost and the investment around, around change management, around the training, around the coaching, around the messaging, and so on. And then we think about, well, what if, what if you designed uh, a, a better experience? And then we think about what is, what is the value of design? And um, I've, I've often found myself in conversations with folks, as I know several of you on the phone have, of what, what on earth would a company do um, with design? And why would you invest in that? What on earth would be going on that I would spend money on this design thinking process? So when we, when we look at this and we think about the, the S&P 500, uh, and this was some stats from uh, a couple years ago, the value of those companies who were investing, who were, who were taking their capital dollars and investing those in design-centric activities with a design-centric mindset outperformed their peers significantly. And I think that in and of itself is representative of not just that there's a tool called design thinking, because that can be, if you want it to be, as useful or not as a PowerPoint, uh, but that return on investment of $1 when you're thinking about that $1 investment in user experience, will often return $100. So when we think about a design thinking workshop, we can often think about what that would look like or feel like, and it helps when it's done in a creative space like our app house. But ultimately, what that needs to do is it needs to create that user engagement because that user involvement and user engagement is gonna drive that adoption. And so when we think about the failure rate of projects that fail because of the user adoption and that lack of user acceptance, it's tremendous. So when we think about the investment that we're collectively making on our way to S4 HANA, if we think for a moment about the, the investment that we're making there, 
one of the simplest things that we can do to help make sure we get the value out of that investment is to make sure that we're engaging our users. So when we want to think about the cost of change management, because often a project has this great big bar, this great big chevron all the way across the bottom of the project plan, and it's called change management, and everyone goes, yeah, it's really important, and there's a great big dollar amount next to it, and no one's entirely sure what it means. Well, I want to talk about a couple of very specific things that you can do that are going to realize value for you and that become actionable steps you can take that you can put into that change management bucket so that you can take things that you would end up having to create like quick reference guides or cheat sheets, um, thinking about some of those processes that are particularly complex and thinking about those training documents and things like that. And I'll, I'll, I'll pick on a couple of our, our, our large enterprise organizations or public sector that we've supported. Um, and even going back to a presentation that was done at an ASUG event uh, two years ago, at, uh, two and a half years ago now, at a, at a go live for somebody that had gone live with our guided purchasing solution. And they were able to take a complex public sector procurement process, things like, hey, is this an emergency and does that help you fast track through the approval process or the workflow? Or, you know, have you gotten a certain number of quotes that you needed? Can you save something as a draft, even if you're working as a purchase rec? Things like that, and making that really easy. I'll touch a little bit more on that, but when you think about highly complex, audit-worthy processes that can be very, very complex or very, very cumbersome, when you think about most large enterprises, for instance, have a heck of a time helping people buy better because they get lost, for instance, in the complexity of the purchasing policy. Um, all of those different things really need to get simplified down because sometimes that process with policy can be very, very complex. So when you have something like a cheat sheet or complex training documentations, let's come back to how we get those back into the hearts and minds of those people that have got to use it. And let's try to make sure that we're investing intelligently and that we're really directing those funds to something that's going to have a lasting impact and a higher return on investment. Because a cheat sheet can be helpful. But imagine for a moment if the cheat sheet was the solution you were using. So when we think about that complexity, we've got the cost of labor, technology, and process, and so on. And we think about what that means, especially if you're coming at an S4 conversion and you're thinking about all of that time and energy that have been invested in automations and validations and things like that. How can we take those, collapse those down, and then ultimately get to the point where we're going to be collapsing the total cost of all of these things? So what we really want to get from is that SAP GUI to something cleaner, simpler, more modern, easier to use, something that's, something that's current in terms of uh, keeping pace with the end user expectations. So some of what we're, some of what we're touching on here is you're, you're on your way to S4 or you've, you know, you've technically gone live. Maybe you're on your first round or two of your implementation and upgrade. Maybe you went live on 16.10 and you're working on upgrading to 18.09 or 18.10. Um, that, depending on public cloud or, uh, or on-premise, then these are some of the things that, that you can do to get value today and that you can, if you're not on S4 already, you can bring it with you. So if anybody's looked at some of the Fiori apps that you can deploy for ECC, for the old ERP, um, most of those basically die out, and if you've made some investments in those, they're more challenging to bring with you onto S4. So I want to show you a couple of things that we can do to, to help with that. Um, one moment, just a quick uh, shout out to the team. They've done a fantastic job. Um, the global first uh, S4 HANA public cloud customer uh, based out of the U.S. is now live on S4 public cloud, and they're a tier one automotive supplier. So just attaboy to the team there. Um, so as you're, as you're thinking about how you can get value out of this, think about that war on complexity. Think about how you can take some of those complex policies, things like that, how do you simplify those down? How do you, how do you get out of filling things out 
in triplicate. How do you get out of telling somebody that they need to get into ME29N and go find the right magic tab and then go click the button that doesn't say approve, says something else? How do you get out of that? And how do you get out of these screens and into something that's a lot more modern? So those process challenges that can really say, hey, who needs to approve this? This can get into some of those workflow, the automation, things like that. How can you take those with you and make sure that you can present those in a way that is highly clear? How do you get out of that lack of clarity? How do you get out of the process confusion? How do you get out of the muck? And then at the same time, you still have compliance issues that you need to make sure that you've managed. You need to make sure that you've got your SOCs audit and other management effective controls that you need to be on top of. You need to be able to report on. And at the end of the day, there is change there. So now you're at a point where you're managing that change, and typically that's done in two ways. One, training, and two, that communication and so on around change management. So as you're preparing for some of those change management considerations, let's, let's think about the, the, the volume of change that people can take at one time. So when we're thinking about something like a tremendous amount of change for somebody in finance, if they're going from legacy ERP and now they're getting into the S4 environment, there's a tremendous opportunity for them to change. And I don't just mean because they have to you know, use some different transaction codes or they've got a different process for closing out the asset accounting year and then the financial year. But I mean, how can they take advantage of the soft close? So that can be something that is very, very valuable for them. How much, how much change can they, can, they, can they handle? Is the upgrade, is the go live happening at the same time as the fiscal year end? That could be a little challenging. So the process simplification, how much of that can you slim down? How much of that can you, can you get back to standard? Or how many of those automations can you either improve or, or tune up? And as, as much as getting back to core practices is, is really good, if there's automations and so on, um, let's say, for instance, one of our utility customers has some significant customization in the HR space that 15 years ago was required custom, but by the time EHP 7 had come along, it was just standard functions. So how do they you know, help them migrate back to standard while maintaining some of, those, some of those automations and improvements that they had? These are some of the things that you want to make sure that you're, you're digging into. But that art of the possible and that engaging users through this, creating time early in the process to discover and take advantage of some of that new functionality is really, really important. And so helping to make sure that you've planned that time to go through some of the discovery of new features and functions, some of the, you mean computers can do this kind of moments, that your users don't necessarily know is even possible, even with some of the out-of-the-box solutions, is really worth that investment. Because several times we've helped an organization that a large SI has done a move to S4, or they've implemented S4, and they've been left with all SAP GUI, sometimes there, there's a wait, 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 it, it can be that easy kind of a moment when they see that there is, for instance, either an out-of-the-box Fiori app or another option for handling that process. So taking the time to do some of that discovery. So the next one is really, when you think about the, the business case, um, for an organization that's, that's, that's planning to go live on S4 and leave it as all GUI, um, let's, let's think about what the, what the end value is. And if it's getting ahead of the 2025 deadline, then you know, there's, there's probably more valuable things inherent in that move and inherent in that investment. Perhaps there's a technical move followed by a, a fast follow to help you know, roll out and improve the user experience around it once those tools are available, once some of the, the under the hood stuff is done, and that's a valid approach. Um, as long as that becomes a discrete plan, it becomes uh, a set of activities that are on the calendar. So you know, in that, there's the standard SAP Fiori apps that are out there. There's the partner apps that are out there. Um, there's other folks that uh, have built some fantastic apps out there. Um, shout out to Jonathan and team there. So um, partner direct or store, um, if it's a, and then a, a pure build, you know, just a custom app, right? I mean, there's, there's a fantastic um, opportunity to really build your competitive advantage and have that really just be your app. Or there's also, at this point, there are quite a few organizations that have built applications that can help you get there faster. So 
at the end of the day, I'm hoping folks can think about Fiori as an opportunity to help really optimize that business and really take that user experience and make the change easy to adapt to. So you can, you can realize that Fiori user experience through a combination of a, 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 what I'll call a, a pure Fiori app, that HTML5 application, or you can realize that with SAP screen personas and a combination of both. So let's, let's talk about a few of those line of business solutions and a few opportunities to take something out to the business there. So on the, on the employee health and safety side of things, um, if you're thinking about the investment that you've made in EHS, really there's a mobility side of things, uh, and then there's sometimes a, a bringing in non-SAP data component here. So when you're thinking about incident management, if you're looking for reporting an incident, um, doing that simply, doing that on mobile, um, one of the applications that our team has put together that's packaged here is uh, an incident management, incident reporting, and an incident share application. So making making EHS super simple and easy. And on the procure to pay and inventory management side of things, this is probably one of the one of the spaces that's really had some tremendous success stories around it, including you know, public sector organization rolling out an entire new purchasing policy to hundreds of purchasers with literally zero training because the app was so easy. And we'll talk about some of this. And, and really, one of the most important things there is collapsing the cheat sheets, collapsing the training, collapsing the process into something that becomes so easy for people to use. So on the purchasing side of things, if you can imagine for a moment, uh, if, your, if your purchasing solution was so easy, that it asks you what you want to buy, how much is it, and then instead of asking you which account assignment type, if you want to put in a K or an N or a P, if it said, hey, that looks like it's over $10,000, is that valid for more than a year? Yes, great, that looks like it might be an asset, then I've got two more questions for you. Then somebody in accounting doesn't have to go back and ask that person for that information later because it's been collected correctly the first time. And somebody has been helped through the process of navigating a complex enterprise process successfully the first time. And it makes it easy. So that example of asking some simple questions to help somebody through a complex process that used to be a transaction code is absolutely possible. And it's been out there and there's several live organizations doing that today. So if you don't need the full guidance side of things and you just want to make purchasing really easy, even if you're not on S4 or even if you have moved to S4 and you need to make purchasing even easier there, again, the purchasing app there really helps. The vendor service entry sheet, helping somebody enter their own service entry sheets, making that procure to pay experience really seamless getting into the materials and inventory side of things. If you're doing a receipt, an issue, a cycle count, again, quite a few organizations running this, including deep barcode scanning. Um, RFID is also an option there. The HR space is another one. Really, if, if somebody still has uh, a, legacy, um, a legacy enterprise portal, um, you know, you really have an opportunity to collapse that and get that into S4. So some of the apps here um, on the team information side of things, if you're really looking to surf the org chart, as we all know some folks will do in an organization, you can go up and down, and within the context of your team, you can get some information about the details of their skills, their performance, their salary history, leave history, and so on. Um, the employment verification letter, that wonderful letter that says, hey, I really work here. Your tax forms, it's tax season, it's not much fun. Um, this is another really nice, simple app. Just give it to them on the phone. Your personal info for anybody that wants to just keep their banking information or their contact information up to date. Uh, this can also be combined with the guidance engine that's also used in the, uh, um, in the, in the purchasing side of things. This can also be combined with the team info as well for guided actions around HR changes if somebody's being moved to a new position. And then Team Time View, if you're looking, for instance, uh, on the left here, this is an app that helps an organization give their managers the visibility to their team's planned, allowed, and remaining vacation allotment. So that as you get to the end of the year, you're not having to take an accrual for either paying out or carrying over vacation because you, on a consistent basis, know whether or not your team has vacation, whether they have a plan to use it, and or whether they have some left over. 
And then if you're looking for details on what folks have been doing with their time, then you can uh, very, very quickly display that and get it out. On the plant maintenance and field service side of things, um, obviously notifications and work orders, service orders are pretty common. Uh, we'll get into a couple of other things in terms of handling operator inspection rounds and making that really simple. Our Fiori for embedded analytics. Um, this is another uh, really simple opportunity to take advantage of that. If you want field ticketing, is another one that I think the slide is hidden for. So on the embedded analytics, if you're giving folks Fiori and you want to know what they're using it, uh, what apps they're using, who's using it, who's not using it, uh, this is another one of the apps that's available. Um, Fiori for finance. Fundamentally, if you're early in the process for finance, there are probably, if you haven't moved to S4 yet, one of the simplest things that you can do here is you can get out there and make some of the approvals and workflow simplest. And that's probably one of the simplest things to start with if you haven't gotten to S4 yet or haven't gotten to simple finance. On the SAP Cloud Platform and ex ex external user side, uh, if you're getting into the customer portal side of things or the vendor portal side of things, um, several examples here on both the customer and vendor portal side that we'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more about. That's one of the things that you can get into now and again carry with you into S4. And at the end of the day, the main idea here is to take advantage of a better user experience, take advantage of simpler process, take advantage of, for instance, that guidance engine to take those complex processes, take those things that used to need cheat sheets and get that to a point where it is so easy and it's done through configuration, not all coding, and that's probably one of the most important things, um, to, that you can take a complex process and overlay your language, your business's language, the terms and, and language that folks are used to using, have that configurable and have that deployed to your users, just like that public sector organization I referred to. So that getting value today and bring it with you to S4 HANA, or even in the case of that uh, uh, fitness tracker company I mentioned, you might already be there and you want to take advantage of some applications that aren't available out of the box. Again, these are some opportunities to get value today and bring it with you into S4 HANA. So quick summary, really, you want to make sure that you are providing a user experience to those users that are engaged in the adoption, that are engaged in the solution, that helps improve that clarity, that helps them move faster through their job, and then helps improve the overall margin, helps protect the return on investment that you're making in the solution. That's, at the end of the day, going to make the difference between a successful, well-received project that's seen by the business to be worth the investment. Uh, and it's going to help make sure that the business is seeing IT as being able to respond quickly and deliver value quickly. So a uh, quick pause here. Um, I think there's a, a few questions that are, that are coming in here. Are there any questions from the audience that you wanted to get into here? We'd be happy to get to those. Thanks so much, Sean. Um, as you mentioned, we're now moving on to the Q&A section. So if you do have any questions, you can submit them using that purple Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll get right into it, though. We do have a few. Uh, the first question, how do the upgrades of your app work compared to SAP apps that discontinue from ERP to S4? Yeah, you bet. So in, in terms of, uh, that's a good question. There must be some technical folks on the line. So a, a big part of that gets into um, the, the underlying technology, and, and effectively this is two parts. One, there's the back end, and two, there's the front end. So as you move from ERP to S4, there, there are some pretty fundamental changes in the back end, and the apps have been specifically built to help you um, turn left if you're on ERP and turn right if you're on S4. And so they've been deployed on versions all the way up to 18.10. So they've also been deployed back as far as EHP 6. So um, in several cases, for instance, on the purchasing side, there are applications that need a significant amount of, um, of, of work to make sure that they can work before and after. And in other cases, they're, they're a little bit simpler. But at the end of the day, the upgrade is effectively handled as a patch, so as part of the support for those applications. 
um, there is a patch release to the customer, and that is applied during the upgrade process. And so, for our customers that are in the midst of planning an upgrade, uh, we work with them to help make sure that they have that patch um, well before they need that. And uh, we really appreciate um, all of the, the successful upgrades that we've been through so far. So, uh, we're, we're pretty excited about that. Thank you. The next question, what are the primary data requirements to be successful with S4, especially if a company is coming from disparate systems and not harmonized data? Yeah, that's a great question. Master data is, is always a really big part of it. Uh, and, and of course, the, the, the standard answer here is it, it depends. So for instance, if your financials are in one place and your, your inventory and materials data um, is, is in a different place and you're going to be using um, MR, MRP as part of that, um, then we would absolutely be um, you know, having to, to spend a fair bit of time to bring that together to make sure that it all lines up. So um, the, the end answer, I think, really comes down to making sure that the, the plan for that data is, is in place, and as part of the planning process, you need to identify each one of those data sets and map that back into the SAP um, formats as early as possible. Identify those gaps because the data is probably going to need to be enriched as it's moved back into the SAP landscape. For instance, the materials uh, master data in SAP is, is quite robust in terms of how rich it is, especially compared to other systems. So if you're bringing in information from other organizations, you're really going to want to invest some time there. And on the financial side, really it gets into balances and, and uh, some of the transactions. So in that sense, it's, it's probably a little bit simpler. Um, but I would be absolutely delighted to, to have a follow-up chat with you to, to dive into that in a little more detail. Um, the last thought that I would leave you with there is prototype, test early, prototype, test early. So make sure that you're working with a sandbox, importing data, testing it, importing data, testing it very, very early in the process. Thank you. The next question, regarding 2025 support, will BINA and HANA result in continued support by SAP, or do we need to move to S4 HANA by 2025? So I'll, I'll take uh, two sides to this question. It's a great question. Uh, I know from, from SAP's side of things, from the SAP software, um, there is absolutely um, a, a position that SAP has taken around their product um, supportability, the database that they want to see you on, um, and so I'll let them speak to that. Um, from, the, from the convergence side, in terms of the apps that we've delivered, um, the apps are designed to work both on uh, a non-in-memory database or on HANA as well, and they're deployed on both. So uh, if you happen to be running one of our apps in 2027 and you're not running HANA yet, um, then our, our support policy would still, still be enforced and, and we're behind you there. Thank you. Next question. Are you seeing customers abandon their 20-year-old ERP systems to Greenfield and not keeping all that legacy data in S4? You betcha. We've absolutely seen that. Um, it's, it's kind of a, 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 it's a baggage question in a way. Um, there's, there's an archival question uh, in terms of needing to be able to go back and get some history on something. Um, but to, to a large extent, there's a, a year-over-year -year comparison is, is often the, the farthest back that most organizations are going in terms of um, the day-to-day the -day comparison information that a manager is looking for, for instance, for their cost center. And when an organization has that much history, uh, we're, we're absolutely seeing folks um, leave behind a lot of that information, keep it available, for instance, for finance to do year-over-year, multi-year comparisons. Um, but in, in terms of a lot of the transactional detail, really we've seen some very large organizations cut over with last year's um, month-end or period-end balances and only open transactions at the time of cutover. So the, the amount of time and effort that goes into um, bringing over the detailed transaction data, if you are going Greenfield, is, is tremendous, especially if you're coming from a non-SAP system. And so that's really driven that in terms of the investment that's required to that. So I think the, 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 the short answer is, is absolutely yes. 
um, and uh, the the cost of um, of investing in bringing over detailed transactional data is is often non-trivial. For some customers, it can be worth it. I think we lost you for a second, Sean. Are you still there? You betcha, still here. Wonderful. Right. Are you ready for the next question? You betcha. So the next question, related to Agile and implementation, do you strongly believe in piloting, prototyping early in the design phase? 100%. And uh, I think it, I think it's a, a, a great question. Uh, believe it or not, this one wasn't, wasn't planted or anything. Um, I, I really like this question for a couple of reasons. One, when you're moving on to a new technology, it's, it's not particularly engaging for an audience or for a group of users to participate in one of the typical uh, blowhard workshops with a bunch of slides and a bunch of whiteboards. Um, it's, it's a lot more engaging for a group of people to sit down and work through a prototype or a early pilot version, for instance, a sandbox, ver sandbox version of the solution that they can work with in, in real life. And so the earlier you can help your team get on to a prototype, the earlier you can help them start to work through their processes and, an, and a day in their life in that new version, with those new features activated. So for instance, if you're going from EHP 7 or EHP 8 and you're upgrading to S4, the, the transition, for instance, for somebody in manufacturing or for somebody in finance has the potential to be tremendous because you've got much richer options in terms of managing and prioritizing open production orders or um, working through your period close if you're on the newer version and you're using the newer apps, for instance, than you would if you sat down and you were using SAP GUI in a new version with a new transaction code for a fiscal year rollover. Um, it, it doesn't feel very exciting. So if you can get them in there and help them see some of the art of the possible and help them reimagine some of how they're going to work when they have access to the answers to questions that they didn't even previously think they could ask. And that's probably one of the most important things in that, in that piloting and pro prototyping. If you're upgrading S4 or if you're designing a new solution for a team or a department or a division, that piloting and prototyping is absolutely critical. And one of the things that folks often wonder, well, hey, why is it worth spending that much time and energy investing in a pilot or investing in a prototype or investing in, in even the earlier low fidelity prototyping, even when you're basically prototyping using wireframes. Um, you know, fundamentally, when you look at the overall, when you look at the overall expense of development or implementation, when you can catch and make a change when you're at the prototype stage, when you're early in the design phase, the cost of making that change on a relative basis is about, you know, a dollar, for instance, out of a hundred, or five dollars out of a hundred. Once you're already in user acceptance testing, the cost of making that change on an order of magnitude basis is closer to seventy-five dollars. So, it's really in your best interest to invest that time early and do that due diligence, not just not just due diligence of you know clicking through a few slides or clicking through a process simply, but really investing in building out the day in the life of early in that prototype phase. It's absolutely worth it. We've seen it work and pay off time and time again. So love the question and 100% endorse that. Thank you. The next question, how does the app support program work? How do you support your apps? Can you repeat that question for me, please? Sure. How does the app support program work, and how do you support your apps? Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the the app support effectively um, the the app is the apps for for the convergent apps. Um, if we're if we're building a, a bespoke app, um, then typically that's handed over, and then there's the option to to continue to support that afterwards. Or if we are um, taking one of our packaged applications 
um, then we would make that available on typically a subscription basis, and it's a, it's a very affordable price. Um, and so that app, for instance, I'll pick our, our, um, uh, our tax forms app that gives you your year-end tax form. If you're in Canada, T4, or um, your, your year-end W something, I think, in the U.S., W, w something. I've forgotten the form off the top of my head. But that app, for instance, would typically be available for somewhere in the neighborhood of $5,000 a year. It's nice, simple. As you go through any updates, any upgrades, things like that, uh, if you run into anything like that, we've 100% got your back to make sure that that's uh, adapted and fixed very, very quickly so that you can um, identify anything like that, and then you'll be able to get that upgrade real quick. So um, that uh, USW2, um, I think, is the, is the US one. Just had to stop thinking about it. Thank you. Next question. What are you advising clients if they take the Greenfield route? that they must do in order to not get back to the place they were at when they needed to make the Greenfield decision? Mm. Great question. Yeah, if you, if you get a group of people in the room and they were the ones who over 15, 20 years built um, or piled on uh, a whole bunch of customizations, if you're, if you're aiming the green, Greenfield route, then uh, it's, it's going to be really, really important to in, invest that time early and get those folks to step through not necessarily their old process, um, but step through the, the out of the box um, and the, the, I'll call it the vanilla processes, the best practice processes, and, and really walk through the new version because there are quite a few things that you would build into SAP GUI that you would never build into the Fiori app because it just fundamentally works differently. You look at it differently, you can evaluate the data, you can make more effective decisions with it. I'll take an example of one of my favorite Fiori apps because I think it epitomizes this beautifully simple solution. Um, it's the sales order fulfillment app. So in, in ECC or in the ERP um, client, you would have to run a dozen different transactions to go and find out if there's incomplete sales orders or if there's things that are missing pricing, if there's a late delivery, missed delivery, and you know a delivery that hasn't been you know created on time, if there was uh, something that hasn't been invoiced yet, and you'd, you'd be sitting there running you know a, a pile of different transaction codes and reports hunting for a problem, and so folks would go in and they would build in a whole bunch of different things to help prevent that problem from coming up, and. Preventing the problem from coming up in the first place is good, um, but stepping back, A, to look at how that process works in S4 to see if that is still a problem or if it's just easier to do correctly and is much less likely to be a problem in the first place. And then two, when you think about the, 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 the app in S4, sales order fulfillment, what it fundamentally does is it goes and it surfaces all of the sales orders that are incomplete or have um, you know, a, a short supply. If you're in a if you're in a make-to-order scenario, uh, it'll highlight a late or a missed delivery. It'll highlight something if the invoice hasn't been generated yet, or if there was an error in the accounting interface. It'll highlight those, and it'll give you a button to go and resolve it. So, the the, the fundamental question becomes different, and and that's probably one of the most important things to think about on the greenfield route is make sure that you are starting that greenfield design process not necessarily purely from the business process, but from, from the opportunity to take advantage of some of that tremendous automation, where instead of looking in 12 different places to find a problem, you have a summarized list of all of the issues across those areas with a simple button to basically go and click and resolve it. And the outcome of the design for your sales order monitoring process will be very different if you have to go and run 12 transactions versus if you've got a super simple cockpit where you can see those issues and resolve them at the click of a couple buttons. Um, and that's, that's probably one of the most um, pointed examples that I can give you in terms of that greenfield route is making sure that you're, you're starting with that art of the possible, what's out of the box, what's there, what can I use, and what didn't I even know was possible. So, you know, on the, on the soft financial close, as you go from 15.11 or 16.10 to the newer versions of, of S4, you could just export your 
uh, financial statement very, very quickly into a PDF document. Um, and in earlier versions, you'd have to print it out and you know muck with it a little bit to make it look like something you could ever show to anyone. And these are some of the things that I think really help reinforce the, the art of the possible and the, and the art of the what is already designed and out of the box. So I hope that, I hope that helps. So again, great question. Thank you. Uh, the next question, how do APO, DP, and SNP work with S4 HANA? That is a great question. So advanced planning and optimization is a, is a non-trivial uh, non subject. So as we're starting to get into um, some of those more you know, deeper topics, um, I'll, I'll suggest that we hold that as a, as a follow-up. Um, I think uh, I'd be more than happy to, to chat with you some more offline with that. Um, I think you'll find that just purely um, S4, uh, just on the time that it takes, um, I think the, the time that it takes to go through and run MRP as you go from ERP to, to S4 is so dramatically short um, that I think some organizations may want to rethink whether they need full APO. Um, and if you're if you're you know much further than that, I would suggest that we that we have a follow up discussion around that because the uh, the the how it works um, is, is probably a topic for for another day as it as it relates to change management. More than happy to have a chat with you offline though. So hope you reach out and hope we can dig into that a little bit more. Thank you. And um, this looks like our last question. How can I request a demo? Oh, uh, okay. I love that question. Um, so convergentis.com, um, that, um, that would be one of my first suggestions. Um, or I just uh, flipped the side slide here. My email address is up there. I would be more than happy to arrange a demo for anyone who's interested. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I will hand it back to you for any closing remarks before I end the webcast today. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Mo. Um, I, I, again, want to take a moment and thank everybody who took time out of their day to join us. Um, I'm, I'm still uh, uh, humbled by the number of folks who joined. Um, fantastic group of folks. I, I really enjoyed the questions. Thanks so much for joining. Um, thank you very, very much again. I hope you found some value in this. I hope you're able to, to think about how you can deliver value early um, and think about um, Obviously, selfishly, I'd be delighted if, if uh, some folks were interested in some of those apps and how those can help. So I um, hope you reach out. Um, and again, thank you very, very much for your time today. Thank you, Sean, for a great webcast. On behalf of ASUG, I'd like to thank Convergent IS, as well as everyone who took the time today to attend this webcast. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question, Sean will follow up with you after the webcast concludes. Before we go, though, I'd like to leave you with some quick information on ASUG for anyone unfamiliar with our user group. ASUG helps connect SAP customers to the people and information that they need to maximize their investment in SAP. If you'd like to speak to someone about becoming a member of ASUG, please message info at ASUG.com. As mentioned before, the recording and slides from today's program will be posted to the ASUG website, and all registrants will receive a follow-up email. Please take a moment to complete the survey by clicking on the green button at the bottom of your screen. With that, I'd like to close today's webcast. Have a great day, everyone.